Well, welcome again to this, our third week of not gathering together as Christ Church Radford for worship. Again, a preface by way of reminder that a recording or even a live stream is not a sufficient substitute for the corporate worship of God. During these days, we are experiencing an interruption of our normal services, and it is an interruption that prevents us from gathering together as an assembled church. But it doesn't keep us from being the church. The church is more than just the weekly meetings on the Lord's Day, but it's certainly not less than our weekly meetings. It's our prayer that during this time, God would help us continue being the church. And with regard to preaching, genuine biblical preaching, as we've stated in the past, is meant to happen in the midst of the assembly of God's gathered people. So this, again, is not so much a substitution for preaching as much as it is a supplement. These efforts that we're making using technology to provide some spiritual nourishment are not a replacement for the gathered church worshiping but a mere supplement for the church while we are scattered. And it's our prayer, our hope, that God will use these efforts to lessen the impact of us being a church that is not gathered together on a weekly basis during this time. Let's look together again at Psalm 90. I'll read Psalm 90 again. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord. How long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we come to you thanking you for your word, for the truth of your word. God, we thank you that your son is truth, that the scriptures reveal him as our only hope for life. God, we thank you that you have preserved and provided your word for us. And we pray, God, that you would use this time in order to sanctify your people by means of of the proclamation of the truth of your word. God, we pray that during these days you would grant 
your church courage to serve when so many are fearful. God, we pray that faith might be placed in you, particularly by your own. And God, also for those who know you not, God, will you impact and affect them as a result of seeing your children serve in the midst of these times in which we find ourselves living. God, for the area churches around here in Southwest Virginia, we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that you would keep them in Christ. God, we pray that you would grant us greater measures of grace, that we might be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, we long as your people to walk in a manner worthy of you. We want to be a people that please you in every respect. We want to bear fruit in all works. We want to increase continually in the knowledge of you. We want to be strengthened with the measureless might that belongs to you in order that we might attain steadfastness and patience, that our lives might be marked with joy and thankfulness because you have qualified us through the shed blood of your own dear son. You've qualified us to be saints now and forever. God, we thank you that as we come in prayer, we don't come to that old mountain of old that could be touched, that to that blazing fire, to the darkness and gloom and the whirlwind that produced fear and trembling. God, we thank you that we don't come to Mount Sinai, but we come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem where you sit and dwell with myriads of angels and the general assembly and church of the firstborn that are enrolled in heaven. God, we come to you and we're grateful that we come to you, the judge of all the earth that only and always does what is right, surrounded by the spirits of the righteous made perfect unto Christ, our dearly beloved, the mediator of the new covenant and to his shed blood, which speaks better than all other blood that's ever been shed. God, we come based on the merit of Christ's blood. We come with confidence, with boldness, attempting to leave aside timidity and reservation in order that we might hear from you in your word. God, we pray that you would accomplish your good pleasure in us, your people, for the sake of your son's glory, we ask. Amen. As we come back to Psalm 90 again this week, I mentioned last week that we wanted to look at Psalm 90 for three weeks in a row, and we considered last week the manifold majesty of God, considering who God is for us as his people, that is, our dwelling place. And Moses begins the psalm, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. God is not just our dwelling place or our refuge, but he has been the refuge and the dwelling place for his people for all time. And because he is an eternal, immutable God, he will be the dwelling place and the refuge for his people forever. So we considered last week this manifold majesty of God, who he is for us, our dwelling place and our refuge, and who he is essentially in and of himself, the eternal one, the immutable one. This week, we want to continue moving through the psalm and consider the next point, the next emphasis that Moses offers in his prayer, considering verses 3 through 12, and I've titled it, Mankind's Misery and Mortality. Mankind's Misery and Mortality. I've split it up into basically three sections even within this middle section. Verses 3 through 6, the pictures. 7 through 9, the problem. And 10 through 12, the potential. The picture, the problem, and the potential. Just by way of introduction, a brief context, a 
bring us back to where we are, where Moses is and the people of Israel during the time when this prayer was penned. Verse 3 really summarizes it well. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. And this is a common funeral text, even to this day. This idea of from dust you came, from dust you will return. That's what Moses and the people of God were seeing day in and day out. Remember, because of their sin, because of the fallenness of mankind, because of their disobedience, they were experiencing over 15,000 deaths per year among themselves. Moses was witnessing nearly 300 funerals every week, 42 every day for 40 years. This was the judgment of God, the discipline of God on his people for their disobedience. When we consider the concepts, the themes here in this psalm, the, the majesty of God, his eternality and his immutability, when we consider who we are in light of what the scriptures say, particularly here in this, call, in this psalm, that we are frail, that life is brief, that is our misery and mortality. And when we consider finally the multiplied mercies of God, which Lord willing we'll consider together next week in verses 12 through 17. We begin to see that the sentiments that we find here in Psalm 90 are never unsuitable for our circumstances. What we find Moses praying here is a reality for us. The context fits. We still live in a world where God is the dwelling place of his people. He's the refuge for all who trust in him. We are still a people marked by the brevity of life, by mortality. And we still are a people who have great hope that God will hear our prayers and draw near and be our help. So let's look at the first point from the passage today. The pictures. Verses 3 through 6. Contrasting the eternality of God... Moses reminds himself in his prayer and others who are around him and us primarily for our benefit now. He reminds us that humans are creatures of dust. I mentioned the verse already. You, God, turn man, that's us, back into dust. You say, return, O children of men. Clearly referring to Genesis 3, 19. For you are dust. God says to Adam, and to dust you shall return. Now, let's remember the context of Genesis 3.19. Why did God say that to Adam? Because Eve had taken from the tree, the fruit from the tree, and ate, and she gave it to her husband, to Adam, and he ate. And they were disciplined. They experienced the judgment of God. And so here, this everlasting God who is our refuge, Moses references, we are a people under your judgment because of our sin. You're a God who must judge sin. You are dust and to dust you shall return. You, God, you're the one who promised to judge because of sin. You must turn men back into dust. You simply say, return, O children of men. We are not merely mortal, as made clear by this statement. We're fashioned from dust and we return to dust. But Moses continues on with this vein of thought here. We're not merely mortal, but we are fading fast. We are born in sin. We are shaped in iniquity. And the longer we live outside of God's saving grace, the worse our predicament becomes. That that common Old Testament refrain that we see throughout the scriptures is true for all of us initially. This refrain, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's true for every single one of us initially. And it's true for us all perpetually without Christ until Christ comes and saves us. The banner over our lives is this. We do what is evil in the sight of our Lord. We're fashioned from dust. We're returning to dust. 
And it's happening quickly. We're fading fast. Look at the pictures, the analogies that Moses offers here. Specifically in verse 5. Three of the, all three of them are mentioned. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they're like grass which sprouts anew. Continuing into verse 6. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. The analogies of a flood of sleep and of grass. You've seen a flood. Some, some people have experienced flooding. It doesn't start off massive, it, but it grows greater and greater by the moment before finally completely taking over everything. This is what's happening in, in our lives. We are quickly coming to the end. Because life is short. You've swept them away like a flood. Or they fall asleep. I mean, just think for a moment how fast time flies when you're sleeping. You go to sleep and a few hours later you wake up and time is just zoomed right by. It never feels like it's enough. For those of you who hit the snooze. You know how fast that eight or nine minutes goes by. It feels like you hit it, you close your eyes, and it's going off again. Or grass. Fresh new grass in the morning, withered by evening, because in this context it's scorched by the desert sun. Moses offers pictures, analogies, to help us comprehend and come to grips with the reality that life is frail, that we are mortal beings. He makes clear, and when we understand the context, it's even more clear that men and women are being taken out of this life in large numbers and at a rapid rate. You have swept them away like a flood. That is, you've carried them away with violence. The only other place this word shows up is Psalm 77. The clouds poured out water, the psalmist says there. It, this includes the violence of a storm. Death is like a storm. It, it sweeps through and takes lots of people and takes them quickly. If we're honest with ourselves, we're actually well aware of how short life is. But for some reason, we stubbornly ignore it. And often, too often, I fear, we live as if we will live forever. Moses is making the contrast here in order to try to, in order to attempt to make it sink down and, and affect us, making this contrast between the eternality of God and the brevity of of humanity, in order that our hearts might be awakened to the immediate need, the immense and immediate need we have for God to show us mercy and to show us kindness. Moses is not the only biblical writer who draws attention to the brevity of life. Listen to these other biblical metaphors. Second Samuel 14, for we will surely die and are like water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. We can understand that. You can imagine taking a bucket of water out in the middle of your yard and pouring it out. And then trying to gather it up again. That's what life is like. We live, we, we can't have it back. We can't gain back a single moment. It's dissipating quickly. Another metaphor Ecclesiastes 6, for who knows what is good for man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life. He will spend them like a shadow. Just watch the shadows this morning, this evening. Watch them vanish away quickly. That's the word that James uses in his metaphor. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Dispersed by the wind, just like that. 
or Luke 12, which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? We can't have any of our life back. Moment by moment by moment, they're gone. Just like that. And Moses is using the brevity of our lives as an argument to persuade God in prayer to be merciful to his people. Using pictures, attempting to pound the truth into our minds. Life is so frail, life is so brief. We are mere mortals. But he doesn't stop there, he continues in verse 7, not just offering us pictures, but pointing out the problem, the problem of sin. Living for a brief time on this earth is significant. But frailty is not actually our main concern. It's not Moses' main concern here. Because we're not only faced with brevity, but we're faced with being sinners. And therefore, verse 7 makes clear, as a result of us being sinners, we are subject to the wrath of God. You can, you can feel the weight coming down on us, hedging us in, as it were. Life is brief. We are sinners. God's wrath is real. Moses sees the majesty of God. He sees the goodness of God. And then he considers man's sin-stained mortality. And exclaims, therefore, the wrath and the fury that is due to us, to sinners, to mankind. You've placed our iniquities before you. Verse 8, nothing is hidden from his sight. He's a God who knows all. Even our secret sins, verse 8, our secret sins are in the light of your presence. We think our secret sins are in the darkness. Darkness is light to God. There's nothing hidden from him. All our sin is laid before him, the all-knowing one, the all-righteous one, the one to whom wrath and righteous wrath belongs. So Moses has not just brought our attention to how short our lives are or how weak and waning we are in the flesh, but he's traced our definite mortality to its root, pointing out what the Apostle Paul says in the letter to the church at Rome, death comes by sin. Because we sinned in Adam, our federal head, we are all doomed to die. Sin always leads to death. Always. Sin will lead to the death of your dreams. Sin leads to the death of all your hopes. Sin will lead to the death of the greatest of your plans. It will lead to the death of relationships, to the death of your health. Eventually, sin results in death ultimately. We will all die. And eventually, it leads to death spiritually or separation from God forever. This is the predicament of all of humanity. Separation from God, alienation from Him. We are spiritual stillborns when we come into this world, void of any vitality, any real spiritual life. It's missing, it's absent. We are unresponsive to the person of God. We are unable to respond to the will of God. And as a result, the wrath of God is felt due to the consequence of man's sin and man's guilt. Wrath is God's righteous response to sin. Wrath is God's righteous response to sinners. We deserve, because of sin, we deserve sufferings. So many of the sufferings that we face are a result of sin. Original sin as a result of living in a fallen world and sometimes actual sin that we ourselves are guilty of. 
And at the end of the day, we can honestly say that we deserve worse than what we have received. Now, we may not necessarily deserve ill treatment from fellow man, but we deserve far worse from God. And though we may not deserve ill treatment from man, God sometimes uses fellow man as his instruments to bring about our deserved discipline. I mean, imagine it. God can even use a rogue virus to accomplish his purposes among his people. God's people are in no way immune to the calamities of this world. Isaiah 45, 7 God is the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these. His sovereign is in control and he's ruling and reigning with love for his people, with mercy and patience towards everyone. And he will rule ultimately in wrath towards those who do not repent. Mankind, frail, marked by brevity and mortality and misery. The penalty of Adam's sin was not only death, but included moral corruption as well. When when Adam fell from his original righteous state before God, He became a morally corrupt creature that birthed, gave birth to morally corrupt creatures. We all, all humanity, bears the guilt of Adam's sin. Because we bear the guilt, we bear the penalty, that is, death, as well as moral corruption. Every one of Adam's descendants is born under the sentence of death of being morally corrupt and being inclined to evil. That's where we are as humanity separated from God. Separated because of sin. Sin that is a crime against the person of God. Sin is not just some entity out there. Sin is who we are and what we do. It is first and foremost against God. It's always an affront to his person. The greatest of all sins is the violation of what Jesus said is the greatest of all commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. When we do not do that, it is an affront to God, to his person. Christ also exclaimed, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when we disobey, it's lack of love. It's sin against God. It's an offense to him and his holiness, his righteousness. All disobedience is a demonstration of our lack of love toward God. Lack of love toward him who is all love towards his people. Sin is so bad that the Apostle Paul referred to humanity, to us, as haters of God. Romans 1.30 Sin is the very opposite of glorifying God. Sin is our determination to set ourselves above our Creator, to usurp His throne, to rob Him of His glory. Sin is fundamentally a refusal to glorify God as God. And sin reveals itself any time mankind, any time we seek our own glory above God's, sin is revealed in us. Remember, Sin is not some rare or unusual phenomenon that's confined to a small minority of the human race out there somewhere. It's universal. All people everywhere for all time 
have been infected and affected by sin. The Bible makes it abundantly clear all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's the picture. Life is brief. Our flesh is frail. The problem, we're born in sin and deserve God's wrath. Next, verse 10 and following, the potential. What is our hope? Really what Moses says here is sober realism. In light of the brevity of life, in light of us being born in sin, we may read it as a bitter complaint. But Moses doesn't pray this as a bitter complaint. It's just reality and truth. All our days have declined in fury. That is fact. We have finished our years like a sigh. So true for so many. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years or if due to strength, 80 years. And even in that, Moses says, our pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. Each day, every day that passes by, we are growing closer to the fateful end, to our fateful end. Thomas Watson, commenting on this verse, said, We come into the world with a cry, and we go out with a groan. We can feel that. We finished out our years like a sigh. We strive and strive and strive, and in the end, it's labor and sorrow. It's gone. We fly away, and we finish with a sigh. Who understands, Moses responds, the power of your anger. Remember, Moses is not just heading towards begging God for mercy, but the psalm is recorded for for our benefit as well, that it might ignite in our soul the reality of the brevity of our lives and the mortality of our souls. The mortality that we will experience as a result of sin. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury? Does anyone, Moses asks, and we should ask ourselves, does anyone respond appropriately to God's view of sin? Based on what he says about it, that it is an offense to him and an affront to his person. Does anyone fear God, Moses asks rhetorically, as they should in light of this. When the wrath of God is experienced, rather than merely explained, All arrogance will evaporate. All men will be reduced to nothing when the wrath of God is revealed. When the holiness of God and the justice of God and the love of God meet together with the depravity and the injustice and the lovelessness of man, the inevitable result is divine, righteous anger. That is, God's wrath. So you have holiness and justice and love in God, faced with depravity and injustice and lovelessness in mankind. And that produces wrath. Divine, righteous anger. God is righteous. And because he is righteous, he is also just. Therefore, because he's righteous, he always does what is right. So he necessarily always acts justly. Psalm 7, God is a righteous judge. And a God who has indignation every day. His righteousness demands indignation. Psalm 9, the Lord abides forever, his eternality. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He always does what is right. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. 
His eternality, his righteousness, the goodness of who he is requires him to judge and to execute judgment. But he does so in righteousness. When we talk about the wrath of God, we must understand, it's important for us to understand that his wrath is not an uncontrollable emotion. It's not irrational or selfish. He is altogether righteous. He is altogether right in every aspect of his dealings. No creature, no man, no woman, no boy or no girl will ever have to fear being judged by an arbitrary decree of an unjust divine tyrant because that's not who God is. He is righteous in all his ways. His justice is grounded in infinite wisdom and perfect knowledge. His justice is firmly based in his commitment to truth. His word is truth. His son is truth. And because his justice and his wrath is based in his commitment to the truth, it demands that all his judgments be just and right. It cannot be any other way. When we think about and consider God's wrath, it's that aspect of God that many Christians feel that they need to make an apology for. Some have gone so far as to suggest that they wish there was no such thing as the wrath of God. Admitting even that This is some sort of blemish, maybe the only blemish on his divine character. Many don't like to think about the wrath of God. And granted, it's a difficult concept to think about. Many can't mention it without an inward resentment against it. Ultimately, a resentment against God for the way that he is. But if we find ourselves in that camp, in that category of not being willing to allow God to be God, assuming that wrath is some sort of blemish on his character, secretly wishing, harboring hopes that maybe hell isn't real and wrath isn't a reality, if that's true, then we are guilty of tolerating thoughts about God that are immensely inconsistent with the revelation that he has made regarding himself in the scriptures. We are guilty of thinking, as the psalmist says in Psalm 50, that he's just like us. Because we assume that if we were in charge, if we were on the throne, wrath would not be a part of our character. We're guilty of assuming Too often that God is soft on sin because we're soft on our own sin. And that God is equally loving towards everyone. We're guilty of assuming that. We're guilty of assuming that that God is loving towards unrepentant sinners even. Or sometimes especially loving towards sin unrepentant sinners. But that's contrary to his nature. It's contrary to his word. Some people entertain the delusion that God's wrath is somehow inconsistent with his goodness and with his love, and they seek to dispose it from reality or at least from their own minds. But what about God himself? He's not ashamed at all. And he makes it well known that vengeance and fury belong to him. Listen to Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as Moses called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. This is the Lord speaking to Moses in his word. The Lord, the Lord God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, 
who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Glorious truths that God is proclaiming to Moses and to us. And we are so prone to stop there with regard to our concept of who God is. But God doesn't stop. He continues. I'm the God who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of fathers on their children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. It is dangerously delusional for us to fail to acknowledge that God is good. And that His goodness demands that He deal with sin that is us in a righteous manner. We want to acknowledge that He's good, yes. But we must come to grips that His goodness, because He's good, because He's righteous, He must also deal with us as sinners in a righteous manner, in a just fashion. It is a terribly grave danger for us all to not be in 100% agreement with God about Himself and about His ways. His character demands that he respond towards sin righteously. His response towards sin is wrath, fury, indignation, and anger. And it is absolutely right that he feel this way. That he respond and act in this way. God's wrath is his eternal detestation for unrighteousness. It is His holiness stirred into activity against sin. It is who He is in His moral perfection. If God does not hate sin, if God does not hate unrepentant sinners, He is flawed, He is not righteous. He is not holy. He is not God. God who is the sum total of all excellency. Cannot look with equal satisfaction on righteousness and wickedness. He who delights. God who delights in what is pure and lovely. Must loathe impurity. And he must hate evil. The character of God, the person of God, makes hell as much of a necessity as heaven. There is not any imperfection in the God of the Bible. Nor is there a perfection that is any less perfect Than any other perfection in him. He is perfectly loving. He is perfectly wrathful. Who understands Moses' petitions? Who understands the power of your anger and of your fury? Moses asked that because if we understood that. We would fly to His mercy. We would flee refuge in Him. Lord, You've been our refuge in all generations. Our hope is there. Moses began with where our hope is and he pointed out why we must realize that that's our only hope. Because of the brevity of life. Because of the frailty of our flesh. Because of the wrath of God. Because of His righteous anger. Because we're sinners and we deserve condemnation. Listen to Peter, considering the eternality of God and the frailty of man, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. That with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day, he's timeless. And then this, what glorious truth, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. Slowness. 
but is patient towards you. He's patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is what Peter is saying. The mill of God's wrath turns slow. He is patient towards you. But we must keep in mind that though the mill of God's wrath turns slow, oh friend, it grinds very small. And the more patience and mercy that is extended from God towards us now, the more dreadful His fury will be in response to your abuse of His goodness and mercy and patience towards you. Tozer, A.W. Tozer wrote this, the vague and flimsy hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the consciences of millions. Oh, I hope you've not anesthetized your mind by thinking in some vague and flimsy fashion that God is far too kind to deal with sin. God is far too righteous and loving to not deal with sin. Karl Marx said religion is the opium of the masses. It's just something we fix our minds on in order to avoid the reality all around us. Connecting Tozer's thoughts and Marx's quote, we might say that wrong thinking about God, insufficient, inadequate thinking about God is the opium of the religious in our day. Do we think rightly about him? Is he the eternal, everlasting, unchanging one? And have we robbed him of his indignation and his wrath and his fury towards sinners? Don't get caught thinking wrongly about him and inoculating yourself to the reality of who he is, who you are, and what your response ought to be. Who understands the power of your anger? Who understands your fury? This is Moses asking the question that we can ask ourselves. What do you think of him? Who is this God to you? What about this righteous wrath that is due you? Has the wrath of God that is due you in your sin, has it been extinguished completely in Christ, quenched by his life, death, burial, and resurrection? And if so, if that's your claim, that all of God's wrath towards you was poured out on his son, hallelujah. But the question still begs, does your life match this claim that you've made? Remember the greatest sin is to not keep the greatest commandment, which is love. And love is expressed in obedience. Is your life marked by obedience to God and to the commands of Christ? All sin, every sin will be properly and eternally dealt with. And Jesus came to save his people from their sin, from all sin, from every sin. And not just to save us from the wrath of God that is due sin, but from the sin itself. Not so that we reach some type of perfection or sinlessness here in this life. But upon God changing our heart, it sets, up a, sets us on a path of growing in righteousness, of increasing in Christ-likeness, of being sanctified to God, consecrated to him and to his son. So the picture is one of frailness of our flesh, of brevity of life. Our life is fading fast. And added to that, we have this problem of sin 
in our lives and of the wrath of God that is due our sin. And then this potential that's rather grim without Christ. Which brings us to the final verse. So teach us to number our days. Here's the petition, the proper response. Teach us to number our days. As one songwriter says it, teach us to make the days count. That we may present to you a heart of wisdom. How do we respond to the reality of the brevity of life? How do we respond to the reality of sin all around? How do we respond to the grim potential of being sinners in a world where we don't live much more than 80 years and most of us don't make it that far? What is our proper response? Wisdom. That we may present to God a heart of wisdom. That is, that we might apply the truths that we possess, the truths that have been revealed in His Word, that we might put our hope in Him, that we might find all of our satisfaction in Him. I mean, that's where Moses goes here in the psalm that we'll look at more next week. Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness. Every morning, teach us to make the days count. Help us to number the days. There's so few And God, you've been so patient, so merciful. If you're not in Christ, the patience and mercy of God is extended to you. Come, come to Jesus. Seek to find all your satisfaction in him. Turn from your sin. Turn from unrighteousness. Turn from wickedness. Lord, God, in Christ is the dwelling place and the refuge of his people. All who come to him, every single one who comes to him, he will in no way cast you out. Come and find refuge. Come and find forgiveness. And if you're in Christ, keep pressing on. Continue seeking to present to God a heart of wisdom. Seeking to do what he has commanded in his word. Seeking to apply the truths as they are in Jesus. Recognizing that all of us came from dust. And that to dust we will return because of sin. But we do not have to experience the everlasting alienation and the eternal separation from God. We have the privilege of being invited in, justified before him because he's a righteous God. Because of what he accomplished through his son in the gospel for us. Our unrighteousness credited to Christ who suffered the wrath of God in the believer's place. And granted us his cloak of everlasting glorious righteousness. That we may stand before God both now and forever. Not just standing before him in the courts of heaven but being adopted into his family, dining at his table, enjoying communion and fellowship with him, both now and forever. May God give us grace to seek him initially if you've never sought him, and continually if you've already found hope in him. Continue pressing onward, pressing inward, making Christ your all in all. God, we pray that you'll take your words, the truth of your scripture, and drive them home into the hearts of your people. That your spirit will convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And that you'll have your own way with your people. In Christ's name, amen.